Adar is one of the most remarkable months in biblical history and in the Hebrew history because it comes twice in the same year. Here in this particular time, we are not only have experienced Adar, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the wonders that Adar has to do with you, and I mean significant, especially because you, my ladies and gentlemen, friends, are in what's known as a prototype city, San Diego. That's right. What you are is a prototype Christian in San Diego. So God wants to use what's going on in San Diego, not only the community, the Christian community in San Diego, but the church and the individuals within that community to be a prototype of what he wants to do in the city, the state, the nation, and the world. <laughs> Adar, and understanding Adar, and the extra month in this year of Adar too, is going to blow your mind because he's been storing up all these wonderful things for you and because we're not only we're a prototype city but we're coming up to the end of the age the church age is in the transitional phase to get out of the church age where churches reigned supreme into the kingdom age where the church singular which is a conglomeration of all God's Spirit-believing, Jesus Christ-embracing, church as joined together as one entity with different flavors, and the world takes notice, and things change. We're, that's where we are, and that's the prototype city where San, that San Diego County is. It's been prophesied over us that we are that. But when you understand what's going on in the month of Adar and Adar too, that makes today very special because we are entering from Adar... One into Adar two. What is this about? Well, every once in a while, you have an instance where you have to be reconciled. The months need to be reconciled. We're going to talk a little bit about that and all the blessings that go along with it. But you need to know that we're in a special time. We're in a time of special provision. And we're in a time where God is going to empower us to do things that are way outside of our comfort zone, but in God's comfort zone for us. I'm going to, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to do, do this fairly quickly, but I need to set some ground rules and instruct some things that are going to blow your mind. That's absolutely going to blow your mind. We're going to study the month of Adar, but also because um, we're in an unusual time, one every, once every three years, there, there is an Adar two. And so what we need to be able to realize is whatever happened in Adar, we get a double portion in this third year when it comes around again. This known, Adar, Adar is known as the pregnant month yes. where you get extra stuff. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about Adar, but before I do, I want to tell you where we're going here. First of all, I'm going to give you a little few facts about the month and months of Adar. And then I'm going to tell you how that means a double portion and a second chance for you and I. And we're going to be able to apply that in our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. I, I'm, I'll be completely honest with you. I, I've been trusting the Lord my whole spiritual life for him to provide for my family and me. And uh, I've had ministry things going on in, the, in my past. And I've entrusted him to fund those. And I've got to be brutally frank with you. I have, you know, we, we talk about the blessings of God and things like that. It's wonderful, but I personally have not seen the fullness of his blessings, not only on my life, but on my finances. Yeah. Right. We all have these promises, and, you know, we can speak the old religious thing. Oh, you should have more faith, brother, or you need to... The truth of the matter is, he's taking us through a process so that we can handle what is... We're on, on the verge of happening right now. Right now. Right, right now. now. Yeah. This is the time where the fullness of his blessing is going to come to pass, and even more so because we are a prototype city, even more so because you are a prototype believer. Amen. So what I'm going to share with you about the truths of the month of Adar is going to blow your mind. You're going to deal, we're going to deal with double portion, and we're going to deal with second chances. Both of them have to do with the two. I mean, but before we do, I just need to do a quick overview of what Adar is. There are two calendars primarily functioning in the world today. There's a solar calendar and there is a lunar calendar. The solar calendar deals with the revolution of the Earth around the sun. 365 days represents a year. 
like a ninja chuck, ninja. <laughs> but au contraire, oh. it's not 365 days. No. Neil appreciate this because he's a mathematician. It's 365 <laughs> days, five hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds. There you go. When you do the math on that, eventually the calendar and the seasons will not match. So God says, you guys need to come to a solution for this. So this year is a leap year where those five hours and 48 minutes and 45 seconds are reconciled back and it's called a 29 day month of February. That is what we just experienced. That's on the solar calendar. But not to be outdone, we have a lunar calendar by which the <coughs> biblical believers function. Now, we have the sun, which is, you know, it's wonderful to determine days and nights and things like that by the sun. But the Jewish or the, the Hebrew believers, they determined their calendar by the harvest times. You ever heard the term harvest moon? Yeah. Harvest moon is a full moon, so they could actually see what they were doing in the evening as well. That is based on a lunar calendar. Now, here's the interesting thing about the lunar calendar. This bespeaks of God's desire to be a reconciler. That's who he is. He's a reconciler. Yes, he so is. here you go in the, the Hebrew, Jewish, biblical month of Adar, and all the way through the different 12 months, and each time you'd go through a, a, a lunar cycle, it's not five hours 48 minutes and 45 seconds, but the lunar calendar loses 11 days each year. Right. 11 days each year compared to the solar calendar. So you can imagine, because God is interested in having things with order, you can imagine what happens if you go lose 11 days each year. You lose 11 days, and the reason that he has the sun, the moon, and the stars, give me the next verse. God said in Genesis 1.14, let the lights in the firmament of heaven divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now you have a lunar calendar, which is 11 days behind the, the, the solar calendar. And what happens? We rightfully celebrate Passover for the springtime resurrection life kind of a thing. But what happens if you have 11 days, you lose 11 days each year? Passover happens on Easter and in and, and, and the right time, and the next day, next year, it's 11 days later, and the next day, year, it's 11 days later, and after three years, you're a whole month behind. And so what God does, he goes, ha, huh, here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to create an Adar too, because I want to reconcile this so it's not in the dead of winter that you're celebrating the resurrection life in springtime. Because if you keep going those 11 days, sooner or later, it's going to be troublesome. He says, I gave my sun, my moon, and my stars as signs and wonders. And the signs and wonders of the sun, the moon, and the stars have to correlate with my resurrected life that I want to show you in the seasons. So he goes, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to give you an Adar 2 every three years. We're going to stick one of those things in there. So that only happens once every three years. But what has happened this year is not only the month of Adar 2, which is an extra month plugged in there, but it's also the, the, the uh, leap year where in the solar calendar they add another day. So we get double portions and extra stuff galore going on this year. This is remarkable. God doesn't do things by accident. There's a purpose behind all these things. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to give you some things you've never heard before in this context. And I'm going to ask you to bear with me. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 2.16, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to give you some truths now that deal with not only the month of Adar 2, but the double portions that come with that and the second chances that come with that. But I'm not just talking a nebulous reference to these things, I'm talking about in the now, because we are who we are, and we are where we are, God is obligated to fulfill his promises for double fortune, to double portions, and for second chances. When you get this, it's going to change the way you're looking at yes. your tomorrow yes. and your future as well. That's right. There's another scripture I'm going to give you right now because it, it protects me a little bit. <laughs> it's found in the book of Acts chapter 17. 
There are two types of believers in the world today, as it was in the days of, of the book of Acts, the early church. There are those that go, and the Bible talks about these guys as Thessalonians, and they go, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there are those who are of uh, Berea. Yeah. Berea, the Bible says, the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they received all things with the readiness of mind, and then they searched the scriptures daily to see if that was so. So what I'm going to ask you to do today is you're going to hear some things that are going to make you run to Scripture and see if they're so. But before you shut out what I'm going to share with you, you need to have that open mind. Re receive all things with readiness of mind. Amen. And then search the Scriptures to see if they're so. Yeah. That's right. Okay? That's the obligation here. And that's the thing that the church in, in the past has kind of refrained from. Preconceived notions about what the Scripture says. And we have missed time and time again, opportunities for God's great blessings. That's right. It's kind of like Joshua and Caleb going, guys, we can, we can take the land. Let's do it. If they'd have acted, they'd have taken the land. And so they had to wait. We have an opportunity here in San Diego, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to be able to take the promised land, not only as a prototype city, but as a prototype believer, Donna. Absolutely, we have that opportunity, but we have to be willing to see Scripture in a little different way than we've misunderstood it in the past. And the other piece of the equation is there are seasons and times for understanding certain aspects of Scripture, and God is opening up Scriptures like never before. He's opening up His Spirit like never before. We are having revival, yes, but it's going to be bigger than a revival, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, boys and girls. It is going to be a movement. It is going to be a transition from one age to another age. The church age is on the wane. And the kingdom age is in progress. And that's where we are. And do you realize the privilege that we have, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to be able to be some of the ushers of this? But God doesn't want you to be an usher without being properly equipped. That means having the resources to be able to facilitate his plans for the coming of the kingdom. And sometimes I've realized that the reason I haven't been, been given the fullness of his promises is because the times were not yet at hand. I always used to embrace the scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of the Lord and his righteousness, and all these things that you have need of will be answered unto you. Mm -hmm. How many have embraced that scripture in your life? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things of which you have need will be added unto you. Yesterday, or the day before, God gave me a revelation. Now, this is not something you can build an entire doctrine around, but this is an application of that scripture. We are in the process of transitioning from the church age to the kingdom age. Prior to this time, we've been in the church age. How can we have been able to search, uh, seek the kingdom of God? It was the kingdom of the church. It was the kingdom of the pastor. It was the kingdom of the leader. We sought what we understood was a God thing to, to, to seek out and embrace. But if you pull back from that, it was really serving a pastor. It was really serving our vision, which didn't have the broadness of the kingdom vision. We are entering into the transition from the church age to the kingdom age so we can truly seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and truly all these things will be added to us. So we can start changing our mindset to be able to receive the promises of God in a way like never before. Because, listen, he wants to fund the kingdom age. He wants to fund it. And you and I get to be those who are participant in the resources to fund that thing. Tara and her team are going to Washington, D.C. Yeah. That needs to be funded by the church because it's part of the kingdom age. It is not tied to individual churches. Yeah. It's not tied to individual pastors. Yeah. And every time, Ray, these guys over here have a wonderful thing going on. But it is a church, parachurch ministry tied not to a singular church, but to the body of Christ. Yeah. This is kingdom mentality. And yeah. God desires this. Therefore, if you seek for the kingdom age... All these other things are going to be added to you. So that's what we're coming into, and that's what you need to be aware of. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about Adar and Adar 2 and what they mean to you. Thank you, Neil. Adar, we talked about, Billy talked about, we celebrate joy because it is Purim and it represents the bad guy being threshed by the Hebrews, by the Jews, when it looked like there was absolutely no hope for them. Israel is kind of in the same perplexion right now. 
we as lovers of Israel must realize that the bad guys are coming to our shores and they're doing stuff that is not godly stuff. But in the month of Adar, which was the month, I'm going to take, pull it back and not talk about that yet. But the month of, uh, of Adar was a time of anticipation, of expectation for God to empower his people. And the, the Feast of Purim happens in the, in the month of Adar and Adar too in this particular instance. And it is to remember the joyful release that God's people have. But he didn't release them then that he doesn't release you now. Amen. It's going to happen. Amen. It's happening, in Amen. fact. Open your eyes. It's happening. Also, in this month of Adar, the, the second temple was completed. It is the last period of time before the Israelites left for the promised land. Amen. What happened when the Israelites left for the promised land? Did they go out poor? No. no. Absolutely not. What happened? They took the, the, well, we saw the, 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 the uh, gold and silver and all these other things. The resources were given unto them who were originally a poor people in, in Israel. I mean, in, in Egypt, they'd become slaves. And God says, the slave mentality is stopping. And now you're going to enter into the months of promise and uh, fulfillment. And that's where we are, ladies and gentlemen, boys and yeah. girls. We're leaving an old age yeah. where the rules were difficult for believers, yeah. uh, especially parishioners. Yeah. They may not have been quite so difficult for some leaders who are, are very wise leaders and they're able to garner success and finances and things like that. But we little guys here, we know we're supposed to believe in these things and we haven't seen the fulfillment of it and God wants to fulfill this because his plan is not so much with the mega church leaders. His plan is through the people who are sitting in the seat that you're sitting in. Yes. That's you. That's, That's right. me. That's, right. That's now. Yeah. Tribe of Naphtali Woo. was the, uh, uh, the, the tribe that is, is uh, favored in the month of Adar. Naphtali, Naphtali, joy, leaping, yes. bounding. And hills and mountains of restraint are irrelevant. Yes. They're irrelevant because that animal has the feet as a hind's feet to go over and above the high places. I was in Israel and I saw those things and, and it, you could see them down on the ground. You go, oh, I can touch the hip. And he's up on a mountain, you know, about 200 yards away. And there's it's a sheer face. It's impossible to climb up. He climbs up with no problem. I'm going, this is an illustration of what we need to be yeah. aware of, not only in the month of Adar, but beyond that. Yeah. So God has given you a strength to be able to climb these mountains that 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, yesterday, you looked at an imp impassable mountain. And God's saying, eh, eh. You are my prototype church. You need to be able to climb those high mountains and you need to be able to be successful. Amen. Haman, when he was intent to destroy the Jews, he asked around and he said, what is the worst month that the Jews can experience? Because uh, I want to kill them on that month because it's going to seal the message. And, they, and his protégés said, Moses died in the month of Adar. He goes, okay, well, well we're going to kill the Jews. We'll kill them in the month of Adar. But what he didn't realize, what they didn't tell him, but also that Moses was not only died in the month of Adar, but he was born in the month of Adar as well. So he experienced, and the same day. So that means what the enemy intends for our evil, God sees it differently. And every time evil comes against you, you go, there's a twist here somewhere. Yeah. That, 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 that uh, gallows that is meant for us, yeah. there's a twist here somewhere. Yeah. Keep hanging around, Haman. Yeah. And we talk about the pregnant month, the month of Adar. And this is the month. Every three years, there's an Adar too, which reconciles. And God is a rec God of reconciliation. Let me just toss this in quickly. God is a God of reconciliation. The Jews and the Ishma the tribes Ishmael, the A Arabs, have, they all function with the lunar calendar, okay? Mm -hmm. The Hebrew calendar reconciles every three years to bring it back to the same, same year. So everything, all, the, all the, the, the feasts and things like that align properly. The Arab nations, they deal with the lunar calendar, but they do not reconcile. 
In other words, it's 11 days later, one year, 11 days later. So their feasts and festivals always change. And so what may have happened in the spring for them is happening in the winter, and, the, and then it's happening in the, in the fall, and then it's happening in the autumn. And all, all these different things are going on with them because they do not have a God that reconciles. So when you see a, a troop of people that have no mercy, that's because their whole mindset is do not reconcile. When you see a people that have mercy, it's because their God has taught them how to reconcile and make things right. Thank you. I'll talk to you a little bit about double portions. I'm going to tell you about how God wants to give you double portions. In this particular month, this particular day, this particular year, this particular, particular millennium is burgeoning with truths of double portions. And I want you to store this up because God's going to call it upon you to access it. It's kind of like God is storing up blessings for you. You know what a, a, like a, um, a card that's a debit card is. Yeah. You put stuff in there and then you get to access it. When you were born again, God gave you a debit card and he's been pouring resources into that debit card ever since. And on our meager understanding, we only know how to get little bits and pieces because he gives it to us. But he is about ready to give us the actual PIN number to be able to access this debit card in fullness yeah. now. Now. Say that again. Now. I love it when you say it. Glory to God. Glory to God. The fullness, the time of the fullness and God's blessings is now because he has to fund his kingdom preparation. And who is he going to use to fund his kingdom preparation? You and me. My wife used to always say when we go through the hard financial times, she would go, God, if... If you just bless us richly, we'll give, it, we'll give you know, most of it away. So just bless us. And I would just embrace, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. And we just live in that, live in that, live in that. And it's, sometimes it's hard to make a payment. It's hard to make a payment. It's hard to know what's happening next week or next year because of the job situation. And I've, I, I have been very frustrated in that. And I know many of you have as well. It seems like we're children of the king and we're not receiving the fullness of the bounty of the king. And he's saying, I, gave, I wanted to teach you patience. Now it's time for the kingdom, right. as in heaven, so on earth. Is, is heaven broke? No. Neither those who are embracing his kingdom in this earth will be broke, especially in these days. Now, I'm talking a little bit about double portions. Let me go back in the book of Isaiah and read a scripture to you, Isaiah 61. Instead of your shame, God says, you will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, and they will shout over you joy, and their, your portion it will be your portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. That's a scripture for you and I. Yeah. Now. Double portion now. Thank you. As I said, double portions are big time right now. We're in a, an unusual time, an unusual time. We are celebrating Shabbat, which is the Friday leading into the Saturday. And what happens on the sixth day in the book of Exodus, God gave a double portion of manna on the ground yes. so we didn't have to worry about it for the seventh day. Amen. So we are currently today transforming, transitioning from Friday into Saturday. Right, right. Saturday is the day of rest. It's the day of the fulfillment of the double portion. The sixth day, God gives us a double portion in preparation for the seventh day. That's what we're celebrating on this specific day right now, the specific day. Amen. Oh, but it's not all. Amen. This is a specific month of double portion. Because not only have we celebrated the blessings of Adar, but because it is a pregnant month, we have a 13th month in a 12-month calendar. Figure that out. Hallelujah. The only way you can figure that out is by saying, God is giving us a double portion. Yeah. Then this month is to reflect that. Amen. We see in the Hebrew calendar, Adar and Adar too. That's where we are. So not only are we today celebrating the Friday night into the Saturday Sabbath, we are celebrating the transition from a single Adar blessing to a double Adar blessing. So the double portion is very clear, but that's not all. Hallelujah. Woo. We're in a millennium of the double portion. Anybody who studies God's week knows that we are in the sixth day of the seven day week. Adam fell and his, his 
His failure was the beginning of the first day of God's thousand year week. A thousand years is though it were a day and a day is though it were a thousand years in God's provision. Well, my friends, that's where the tape ran out. <laughs> so I'm going to complete this teaching the next day. Bible students will recognize that we are in the sixth one thousand year period of time since the fall of Adam. And if you were to mark this scripturally, you'd realize 6,000 years has progressed unto this day or these days. And we are just in the process of entering into the seventh day. And as we have learned earlier, the sixth day was a day of double portions to prepare for the seventh day. Ruling and reigning with Christ, it is a, a thousand year day, if you will, from God's providence. So that is a time right now where we are entering into a double portion time to set the resources for his believers to be empowered into and through the seventh day. Seven, of course, is the day of perfection or fullness of maturity. But it doesn't end there. We're not only entering into the double portions tied to the close of the sixth one thousandth year day in God's provision, but we are also entering into the 70th Jubilee year. Now, we talk about seven being an import, important number as being the fulfill, fulfillment or the maturity or the perfection of things, and when you take seven times ten, you have seventy, and so it multiplies the value of the seven perfection or maturity by 10 times. So we are currently in the Hebrew year of 5776, and 5776 is actually the 70th Jubilee year. This was the celebration, or is the celebration, of the first Jubilee year when Caleb and Joshua crossed the Jordan River with the tribes of Israel into the Promised Land. So look at it this way if you want to talk about double portion blessings. We are into the crossing over our Jordan today <laughs> into our promised land. The transition, if you will, from the church age or the church ages or the ages of the church and church administration into the kingdom age and the kingdom administration. It's a remarkable thing. And this is the component that God has been longing for since the beginning of time, literally. For us to be restored to him in intimacy. This 70th Jubilee year in which we now live illustrates that. Coming out of the wilderness, so to speak, as Caleb and Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, so are we being entered into a more present-day truth promised land. Caleb, interestingly enough, was of the tribe of Judah. So, symbolically speaking, Judah, again, leads the way into the Promised Land, as it is today in this prototype city of San Diego, with you, my worshipful, prayerful, pastoral friends, being worshipers is leading the way into what God is doing in San Diego, in this city, this nation, and this world. So we talked a little bit about the double portions that God has put, in, he's put on our debit card, all these double portion blessings have been given to us time and time again. So God has been awaiting the time where he can really unleash all of his resources to and through his body because we are the pre preparation for the fulfillment of the kingdom age. As a prototype city in San Diego, you, my friends, as a prototype believer within San Diego, get to be a prototype of what God is doing here. So if ever there was a time for his kingdom to be financed, it is now. And if there ever were people through whom that financing should come, it's the body of Christ. That now is the time for all these things that have been embedded or implanted upon your debit card can be fully accessed. The next portion of my teaching is going to talk about how we can access the contents of this debit card. In the past, God has been giving us stuff here and there as necessary, but in many people's lives, 
mine included, it has not been the overabundance of which Scripture speaks. But I want to suggest to you, my friends, that now is the time because we're entering into the kingdom age and he needs his kingdom age financed. And who better than us? When better than now? The element I want to talk to you now about is the element of second chances. This is the way that we're going to be able to access that debit card and understand the PIN number, if you will, the access number for the acquisition of the contents of this debit card that God has given each one of us at the point of our salvation. And I want to talk about second chances because this is going to be the key when you understand how second chances play a role in accessing the funds and the blessings and the anointings and the double portions that have been allotted to us, how to access those. You'll understand when you understand God's provision through the second chance, then you will begin to understand what that key code is to access all the resources and blessing that God has for you so that you can apply that to his kingdom. Talking about second chances as it relates to the month of Adar, two and a dar two being an illustration of a double portion and also of a second chance i want to talk about the whole theme of god's second chances see from the very beginning since the fall of adam man was given the first chance to be repentant and to be cleansed and to have oneness with god again and that was god gave them the law through moses and the laws, the touch not, handle not, and the scripture says that there's none that have been able to obey the law, and all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that was the first opportunity God wanted to show us that there was a way to get restored to him, but it was in following the detail, every jot and tittle of the law. Well, we know the answer to that, that mankind cannot follow the law because it is too high, too difficult for him. That's why God provided a second chance in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who was the only one that could fulfill all the details of the law of God. And as he did, then his death, his burial, his resurrection, the shedding of his innocent blood on our behalf can be counted for us. So Jesus becomes our replacement in fulfilling the law so that we indeed get what's known as a second chance. Which brings me to John 3, 4, where Nicodemus is talking to Jesus. And Jesus is talking about, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born and Jesus says he can be born again. So the reference to the second time here is that God has given his people a second time for redemption, a second time, a second opportunity to fulfill the promises. As we understand his truths in giving us second chances, we're going to understand how to acquire that access code. The reference to second chance is also found in the book of Genesis with the life and the lifestyle of Joseph. We find in scripture as we study Joseph in the Old Testament that Joseph was a type of Christ. We can learn lessons about the second chance or the second opportunity through studying elements in Joseph's life. Well, in Acts 7, it talks about there being a dearth in the land and that Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt. He sent out our fathers with Reuben leading first, as the scripture says. And then in Acts 7, it says, And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers through the leading of Judah, when Judah led the way. And Judah, of course, is praised. The first attempt was only modestly successful, and Reuben led that. And you know the story that Joseph was rejected of his brothers and sold into slavery and taken to Egypt, and he became the number two in command. We're talking about number two, Adar two, double portions, and second chances. But Joseph was the man, the number two man in Egypt because of his brothers selling him out. It was a time of provision. And Joseph was there, and his brothers came not knowing it was Joseph. 
The first time they came, Reuben led the way, and the Bible says that he gave them corn, he gave them provision, but he kept one of the brothers back, and the remaining brothers went back into the land of Israel. And they had sustenance for a season, but then they ran out of corn. And that's similar with us today. We have had this relationship with Jesus, and we have been given levels of provision, but we run out of provisions, and we have to be afforded a second chance. In this particular instance with Joseph, the tribes under Israel were told to go back a second time and receive more grain, more blessing, more sustenance. Well, this, this second time where Joseph actually revealed himself to his brother. And we know that the second time it was Judah who led the way. Judah represents praise for us today as we access the provision of God as we enter into a, an entirely new age and era in the church. From the church age to the kingdom age, God wants to finance this kingdom age. And there are Josephs in the land today to sustain that. And those Josephs are going to be accessed through Judah, worship and praise. Let me talk to you about one more instance of this second time, the second chance illustrated in scripture because this is going to be the key for unlocking our understanding and to be able to access that debit card. This is one of those key card numbers that is going to open the access to this. There are others as well, but this is the one I want to close with today. Hebrews 9.28 talks about the second time. Listen carefully. This is one of those times, by the way, where you're going to have to receive all things with readiness of mind <laughs> and search the scriptures to see if they are so. Hebrews 9.28 so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them who look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. In other words, for those who look for him, there will be a second chance of intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to have you draw close attention to this term. It says, for those who look for for him shall he appear a second time. A lot of people uh, identify the scripture as a Jesus coming again, as in uh, where it talks about lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's a different reference because this reference refers to only those who look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. The other reference to Jesus coming again, every eye shall see him, every eye shall be hold him, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is indeed the Lord of Lords. That and this are two different times. And I want to suggest to you that there's a time that we are in right now in the transition from the church age into the kingdom age where his saints need to have a higher level of a, a sensitivity and observation and expectation of the Lord appearing or showing himself in unique ways in these days to empower his church to actually be the fullness of his body, be the fullness of his bride, to prepare the world for Christ's second coming where everyone will see him and behold him. But this first illustration of his appearing is not coming in the tangible sense. There are two different words in the Greek that talk about God's coming. The one that this scripture refers to, he shall appear the second time, that word is the optome. Optome, and it means to gaze upon or to have something appear before you. It's different from the tangible coming of the Lord. This is a, a seeing him, a sensing him in a more spiritual sense, an intimate sense nonetheless, but a different sense than in the actual tangible appearing where every eye shall see him and every tongue shall confess and everyone will realize this is the Jesus whom you crucified is returned among you. Two different times. The word optimi means more like an appearing of as in a spiritual application of him actually seeing him in a different way. And then there's the word parousia 
which actually means the tangible coming of the Lord. Those are two different Greek words, and you have to pay close attention in Scripture which of these two words is being used because it has a great importance as to the interaction between he and the ones that are in pursuit of him, you and I. Also, this is a, a good illustration of the Scripture that talks about Matthew 25, the, the ten virgins, the wise and the foolish virgins. Some were had the oil and they were prepared and were looking for them as the other virgins were as well but because they had the oil of understanding and anointing and they had invested and vested in the pursuit of him their lights were still on and though they all slept when he came they awaked and they were able to go in to him and the other virgins were not there's a time for those who look for him shall he appear a second time it's important to understand this in these days because God wants to energize his church and he's going to empower those in particular who have looked for him and are pursuing him. Let me give you another scripture that refers to this, Optume. In 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we're in the transformational process, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear to us, this is not the parousia, appearing as in coming again, but when he appears to us, when he optimei to us, we will realize that we will be like him. For we plural, shall see him as he is. Get the picture here. There's a time frame coming as the kingdom age begins, and we're in that beginning time right now, where those who look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. And the scripture says here in 1 John 3, 2, but we do not know, it does not yet appear to us what we shall be, but we know that when he shall, when he shall appear, his revelation is before our eyes of himself, that we will be like him. We'll go, hey, wait a minute. God has made me to be like him. But it's not me singularly, it's me collectively. We plurally, we shall see him as he is. But the funny thing, the exciting thing about this is we are going to be able to see Jesus in one another. It shall, we shall be as he is collectively. So this is the revelation time where the church is going to be entering into the super powerful mode of ushering in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because we shall be like him. The scripture talks about, I'm going away that these things that I have done you will do greater when the Holy Ghost is coming upon you. This time frame is the time frame when the fullness of that is to come to pass as we, his saints, begin ushering in his kingdom. And as God has his kingdom ushered in, it needs to be financed. And guess who is going to be blessed with the resources to be able to move this kingdom age forward? Those people are sitting in your chair right now. One more scripture that talks about the second chances. And this is a scripture you've heard before, but I'm putting it in a different context. So maybe your eyes are going to be opened here and you're going to realize some things about accessing his resources for his kingdom's sake. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery of the Gentiles. It's a mystery, what's going on, but it says, here's the solution to the key to that mystery. It says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. This is the key. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This Christ is optimei in us. He's appearing in us collectively so that the body of Christ gets to fully be the body of Christ. The body of Christ becomes the bride of Christ. And that's the desire of Christ's heart, is to be restored with his beloved bride and rule and reign for a thousand years. So this optumai is a, a vital aspect of this. And I want to suggest to you that we're going to be able to more and more see Jesus in the lives of each other, and collectively we're going to be able to do his bidding. Now, an important way in which Christ was revealed to his saints throughout Scripture was tied to the breaking of bread. And this is how we're going to end this teaching, tied to the breaking of bread. We're going to have communion with one another. And within this communion, I'm going to have you do communion in a different way so that you can comprehend a different facet 
of taking of the communion. I want to suggest to you that the communion traditionally through scripture was a time where Christ was revealed to the people taking the communion. In the days of Abraham in Genesis 14, Melchizedek was the king of Salem or the king of peace and many people believe that he was the pre-incarnate personage of the Lord Jesus Christ and that when Abraham met him he got to see Jesus in a pre-incarnate state. In other words, Melchizedek illustrated the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the Gospels, Jesus said that Abraham rejoiced to see his, Jesus' day, and he saw it and was glad. When could Abraham have seen Jesus' day? One of those times in which Abraham could see the day of Jesus Christ was in the breaking of bread with Melchizedek. And Abraham rejoiced because he realized that God was going to come again and save his people. But the breaking of bread is a time of revelation about Jesus Christ. Another instance of this is found in the book of Luke chapter 24. It's the story of Emmaus Road when the two disciples were walking along the road and they were dejected because Jesus had died and was in the grave and they were forlorn because all these promises they thought had just been dashed, had come to an end. <laughs> and then one appears as a sojourner with them and they didn't recognize who it was but we know that it was Jesus, but they didn't recognize who he was. So during this journey, he communicated to them the truths of the gospel, starting from Moses and the law into the prophets and how Jesus fulfilled that. And then they concluded their journey and were going to have supper. And they invited this sojourner to join them, and Jesus, of course, did. And the Bible says it was at the breaking of bread that he revealed himself to them. And the Bible says the scales fell from their eyes, and they knew him. And they rejoiced because they realized that Jesus was the fulfillment of all these promises, and this Jesus whom they thought was dead had risen again. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing in the scripture says, and when they had realize it was Jesus, he disappeared from their sight. It's a perplexing thought that he appears to them and when they recognize it's him, he disappears. The truth of the matter is because they recognized it was him, they realized their own calling as individuals of this body of Christ and so he could depart from their vision and they knew that he was there among them anyway. Now I want to suggest to you as we prepare for communion today that communion table is a vital way to properly discern the body of Christ, his church. Now I'm going to give you a scripture and you've taken it one way perhaps in the past. I want you to have a new look at this scripture. It's found in the book of 1 Corinthians 11. It talks about the administration of the communion and it says, in 1 Corinthians 11, to examine yourselves before communion. It says, because those who eat and drink without properly discerning the body of Christ, they eat and they drink judgment unto themselves. And that is the reason why many are sick and weak, and then there is a number that have fallen asleep or that have died. And I want to suggest something to you. When we take communion, of course, we do want to discern the, the body of Christ, meaning Jesus himself and his, his death the sacrifice of his blood and his torn flesh as illustrated through the wine or the fruit of the vine and the bread. But there's another element to this properly discerning the body of Christ. Beyond the literal, specific, singular body of Christ, God wants us in communion to discern the body of Christ collectively. So as we break bread, we realize it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. We shall discern Jesus. We will discern him as we shall see him in the body of Christ. And when we have this revelation, then God wants to empower us to be the launchers of this kingdom age. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory.
So when we take communion today, while we do discern the literal body of Christ, singular, but we also need to discern the collective body of Christ, properly discerning the body of Christ. And the Bible says, because we have not properly discerned the body of Christ, there have been many that are weak and sick and fallen asleep or died. As we understand that we collectively are part of his body, then healings are going to happen, weak are going to become strong, sick will become well, the dead shall be raised from the dead. That's what's about to happen in these days as God ushers in the kingdom age. And as he ushers in the kingdom age, he wants to give all the bounty that he has stored in this debit card to you. And as we understand that part of the solution to accessing this debit card is seeing Christ in one another, then God can empower us with his resources to prepare the way for his return. How remarkable is that?